Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, if uh, like some of our panelists here in, the, in China. Um, and welcome to this Big Data China event. Have US-China tensions hurt American innovation? I'm delighted to have here a great group of experts to discuss the topic. And I am especially uh, delighted to introduce Scott Rosell, who is the um, the Freeman Spoyi Fellow uh, for International Studies and co-director at Stanford Center on China's Economy Institutions, and then one of the main people responsible for the creation of Big Data China, um, the, an initiative that aims to bridge quantitative uh, academic research and the policy world. I'm Ilaria Mazzocco, Senior Fellow at CSIS, uh, as a trustee chair in Chinese Business and Economics. And that, now I'll pass it on to Scott, who will introduce our first two panelists. Uh, thank you, Ilaria, and, and thank you to everyone at CSIS and um, the, your whole staff. They've done a great job in um, getting this ready, and thanks to all the panelists. Um, today, we're doing Big Data China feature number five, the impact of U.S.-China tensions on U.S. science. Uh, I think it's a, it's a very, very important topic, and uh, looking forward to this interaction with the, um, the authors of this paper and uh, the panelists and then you out, out in the audience. Um, uh, I'm gonna introduce the uh, two speakers today, the, the co-authors of the paper under which this big uh, this feature is, is um, being created. And then I'm gonna turn it back to Laria and she's gonna run the rest of, of this show and looking forward to interacting with you, everyone out, out there in the audience. Um, the first um, uh, speaker and um, the, the co-author of the paper is Margaret Roberts, um, many people know her as Molly. She's an associate professor of political science at the University of California, San Diego. Her research interests lie at the intersection of political methodology and the politics of information with a specific focus uh, on methods of automated contact, content analysis and the politics of censorship in China. Currently, she's working on a whole variety of projects. She's very, very productive. Uh, for, for very high quality work that span censorship, propaganda, topic models, and other methods of text analysis. Uh, thanks for, for doing this today, um, Molly. And she'll be the main speaker in the event. The co-author who's done this and many, many other um, uh, uh, papers that are, that are very interesting and important is her colleague at the University of San Diego, uh, Ray Shia Jia. Uh, she's also an associate professor of but she's in um, the social for economics at the School of Global Policy and Strategy. Ja is interested in the interplay of economics and history and politics. One stream of her research focuses on understanding elite information and elite influence um, in both historic uh, and modern context. And th there's lots of uh, uh, back and forth in this. It's, it's very important work. More recently, she started following the ongoing transformation of the manufacturing sector in China and expanded her interest to labor and te technology issues. Um, I've known Rachel for a long time. She's a fabulous scholar, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, to this feature. And uh, Alaria, I'll give it back to you and um, uh, I look forward to it. I got my pen out to take notes. Thank you, everyone. Great, I think we actually will let Molly take over with her presentation. Good. Awesome. Um, well, just to first a big thanks uh, to Ilaria and Scott and CSIS and Stanford for, for having us and also for all of these panelists. We've just, I feel so lucky to have such a wonderful group of people here to discuss this. So this is really a neat opportunity for, for us. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about today about the impact of US-China tensions on science. Um, and um, this is, you know, as as Scott said, with Ray Shui Jia, who's a professor at the School of Global Policy and Strategy, um, also co-authored with Ye Wang, who's a professor at the University of North Carolina, and Eddie Yang, who's a PhD student at UC San Diego, currently a pre-doctoral fellow at Stanford. Um, so um, let me get this started. Okay. So the the sort of focus that we want to talk about today is this tension. One on the one hand, science is becoming increasingly international. Um, so we see that the number of sort of papers that are co-authored by authors in different countries has been increasing over time. It's been increasing quite a bit. We know that um, from just looking at bibliometric data. 
Um, we also know uh, from the literature on science of science that kind of the most cited science comes from international collaboration. The most productive scientists are involved in international collaboration. So this is um, science and, and some of the kind of the cutting edge science is often happening with these international teams. And historical research has also shown the importance of international collaboration, um, the importance of the flow of ideas and immigration of scientists um, for innovation. So we, there's been a lot of really interesting historical research looking at this in many different contexts of how important sort of open science is for innovation. So the free flow of ideas we know facilitates progress in science. Yet, of course, science is not you know, completely separate from politics and science and technology are key components of economic growth, of military capability. Governments care about science, governments fund scientific research strategically, they fund basic science, but they also fund science for strategic um, uh, purposes. Um, and international collaborations can cause legitimate concerns, um, such as the leakage of military technology or international prop or intellectual property, or also the ethics of collaboration when certain technologies could be used for human rights abuses or other types of domestic repression. So we know that politics influences science, but we know that open science is also really important. And this is when we start to come into tension, right? So this is, uh, you know, come uh, up a lot recently because of U.S.-China tensions in science. Um, so the U.S. has long been concerned about the loss of intellectual property to China. Um, we've seen examples of cyber theft, of economic espionage, of use of U.S. science by the Chinese military, targeting of U.S. research by the government of China. Um, and this has all caused a lot of concern that um, that there's uh, going to be a leak of international prop uh, intellectual property or military technology. There's also been ethical concerns that have come up as well. And this um, is one of the reasons or one of the motivations behind the China initiative, which was the Department of Justice countering national security threats from China. Uh, this initiative ended in February of 2022, but lasted uh, for about four years um, trying to uh, trying to sort of um, counter these threats. But this wasn't just in the Department of Justice. This also um, was um, uh, uh, this created policies also at uh, US uh, science funding agencies. So um, the National Institute of Health, the National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, all became aware of these issues. And in August of 20th of 2018, the NIH sent a letter to American institutions about foreign interference in research and sort of starting investigations about uh, foreign interference in research. This, we think, um, you know, we know hundreds of scholars were investigated um, after this letter was sent. As of June 2020, so this was a few years ago, 54 researchers lost their positions. This, in these investigations were not focused exclusively on China, um, but 93% of those investigated, their source of, support, of foreign support was from China. So we know that the vast majority of these investigations, um, the, the source of foreign support was China. And one of the criticisms of these investigations is that they've mostly been focused on disclosures. So mostly they've been focused on um, uh, uh, researchers who have failed to disclose this, that they are, have funding from China or that they are collaborating um, with institutions in China. Um, and while these disclosures are really important, obviously, um, there's sort of been very little policy guidance about what types of research should be avoided. So there's sort of a lot of uncertainty on the parts of scientists about what is what is you know okay and not okay in, in the eyes of the US government and because so much funding comes from the US government um, people have been concerned that this has caused a chilling effect among scientists that scientists have just wanted to avoid collaborations with China um, and and make perhaps this is her innovation. So there's been a lot of discussion about the merits of these investigations about the merits of the China initiative what we really wanted to focus on within this paper is what has been the impact on US science and we wanted to try to quantify it. And this has really high stakes for science right as I said before scientists with international collaborations tend to also be more productive. And in particular scientists with international collaborations with institutions in China are among the most productive. So the people affected by these investigations are also some of the most productive scientists within the US right. <clears throat> So our questions were, has there been a chilling effect on US science 
US-China scientific collaboration, do we see that people who are more likely to be affected by these investigations also have a loss in productivity or a loss in innovation? Have, how have researchers specifically who have existing collaborations with scientists in China been affected? Which scientific fields, institutions, and researchers have been most effective? And last, this is much more difficult to quantify, but we really try to get at this as just like a first step, is what is impact does this have on competitiveness of the US and China in science? How is this affecting um, how US science is? So the main findings, just to provide a quick summary of the paper, and I'll get a little bit into the details uh, before we get to our discussion, is that the investigations coincided with a small but significant decline in the productivity of scientists, um, US life scientists with a history of collaborating with scientists in China. So we do see that people are more likely to be invested, uh, uh, affected by the investigations are also uh, have a decline in productivity relative to scientists um, with other international collaborations not in China. We also find that these effects concentrate in particular fields, especially those with high US-China collaboration and high levels of NIH funding. And last, we provide sort of suggested evidence that this might have some impacts on competitiveness by showing that affected fields have progressed more slowly in both the US and China in comparison to the rest of the world. And I think there needs to be more work to sort of tease out uh, this in the future. So the data that we rely on are two main big publication databases. Uh, the first is PubMed, which is sort of the primary database of papers on biomedical topics. This is actually the NIH's database. Um, it has about 12 million published paper, published articles in it from 2010 to 2020, and that's what we focus on. The second is Dimensions, which is a much more comprehensive database that covers publications from various disciplines. And we use this to look at sort of total publications across a lot of different scientists. <clears throat> So to just give you some descriptive statistics about how US-China collaboration has changed in recent years, this is um, looking at across 2010 to 2021, the share of US publications in PubMed that were authored with scientists in these different countries here. So what we see is that actually China um, and US collaboration, China was not the, um, the primary collaborator for US scientists in 2010 in, um, in PubMed. Um, but became it very quickly uh, until 2018. And recently, since 2018, we've seen this drop in um, the proportion of papers uh, collaborated with scientists in China, even though we do not see that happening uh, with scientists in other countries. So this doesn't quite answer our question about how it's impacted innovation, because it could just be that, that there's a substitution going on where scientists who used to collaborate with scientists in China, now collaborating with scientists in other countries are just as productive, right? And they could have just switched their, their papers to these other countries. So to really look at whether or not the investigations are affecting productivity, we have to look within scientists, which means we have to understand how scientists who are more likely to be affected by the investigations, how their productivity has changed, and we have to have a control group. So we have to look at how they've tapped, changed relative to scientists who we think are less likely to be infected, affected by the investigations, scientists with collaborations with scientists in other countries outside of China. So to do this, we employ something called a difference in difference design to analyze the, NI, the impact of the NIH investigations. This is a very common design in um, economics to estimate a causal effect. And we, what we do is we focus on principal investigators, so PIs as we call them, with at least two papers from PubMed from 2010 to 2014. Then we look at people who we think are more likely to be affected by the investigations, PIs who had at least one paper collaborated with scholars in China in, those, in the early days, and then we add between 2010 to 2014. And a control group is PIs with at least one paper collaborated with scholars from any other foreign country from 2010 to 2014. This leaves us with about 32,000 treated PIs, PIs we think are more affected by the investigation, and about 70,000 untreated PIs. And we, and in total, there's something like 4.1 million papers. We look at a treatment date of January 1st of 2019, given that the letter was sent in late of uh, late 2018. And we look at a pre-treatment period from 2015 to 2018. So one of the things about this difference in difference design is you need a time period to look at trends before treatment. And that's why we look, we, we define our sample based on 2010 to 2014. 
So this is just some raw data of um, uh, the ratio of publications and citations in the treated versus the control group in PubMed um, during this time period. So as you see, and the treated group is a more productive group than are the control group. Um, the scientists who collaborated with in researchers in China are more productive generally than scientists who have collaborated with researchers in any other country and, and other and other countries as a whole. Um, and but and so this ratio is high, uh, uh, is greater than one. But we see that in 2018, this ratio declines. That starts declining. Um, and we also see this in citations as well in PubMed that this ratio starts declining. This also then comes out when we actually run the difference in difference model, which takes into account both um, in what we call investigator fixed effects and time fixed effects and other controls is relative to 2018, which we're here fixing at zero. We see no difference there between, uh, um, in the pre-treatment time period, what we call parallel trends, but we do see an effect here where the treated group is, is, um, is doing worse, basically, than relative to the control group in the post-treatment time period. <clears throat> One of the things that we are interested in looking at is whether or not there are certain institutions that were more affected. And what we thought was that institutions that had more um, sort of public investigations would also have greater, be, have greater effects. We didn't find this to be the case at all. Um, here are a whole bunch of different institutions and our estimated effects for these different institutions. Overall, there's just like a small decline across all institutions. Um, but in red are the ones that we found were had sort of high profile investigations in the media. We don't see them clustering on the on the um, the more negative uh, 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 estimates over here. And so it seems like this is sort of a broad effect across a lot of institutions. One of the things we did find, though, that the effect concentrates within certain fields. And what we use here is dimension sort of automatically puts papers into different fields. So we use those automated um, uh, classification for papers used from dimension. And if you estimate the effect for each individual field, what you get here is um, here's the estimate. So these fields on this on this lower half of the graph are more affected out by our estimates by the investigation. And here is the proportion of NIH funding in each of these fields. And we do see that on average, fields with more NIH funding also tended to have be more affected. We also looked at the proportion within each field of US-China collaborations. We found that fields that with more US-China collaborations also tend to be more effective, uh, affected. So we did see that certain fields tended to be more affected, especially materials engineering, physical chemistry, biochemistry, genetics. Less effective fields are more like public health and uh, public health and health services, um, clinical uh, uh, sciences, et cetera. So um, we also found, and I, um, I I don't have a plot for this here, but we also looked at um, the impact of uh, the the uh, like scientist identity sort of on um, on uh, on um, the uh, on the uh, the effect. So what we did was we took a whole bunch of different all of the different scientists' names and we used an algorithm to try to um, identify whether or not they were of Asian. They were um, like more likely to be of Asian origin, um, and we found that overall there was no effect, um, like no greater effect on total publications, but we did find a greater negative effect for those scientists on NIH funded publications and China funded publications, which both seem to decrease substantially in this period. And the last thing um, that we wanted um, to look at was whether or not there was an impact on competitiveness in science. And so this is um, much more difficult to get a causal estimate on. So here we're going to look at a correlation. We think this is suggestive evidence, um, and we need to look into this um, more. Um, what, so what we did was we got total counts of papers in each field by US authors, by China authors, and then by authors in 48 other countries. And for each field, we used a diff and diff, that same design, to estimate whether or not China and the US was relatively increasing or relatively decreasing in growth in comparison to other countries. And we correlated this with our estimate of how affected these fields were. And we did find that fields that tended to have greater negative effects, so on the x-axis here is our estimates of the effects of um, the investigations, 
Also, tend, also both China and the US tended to grow a little bit slower relative to the rest of the world. And I think this is suggestive evidence that this could be impacting competitiveness and we need to sort of dig a little deeper and try to figure out um, this um, in future work. So the last thing that we did within this paper and, um, um, is we uh, also conducted some interviews of US scientists. And we wanted to sort of understand what was the mechanism that might be explaining these different these results that we were getting in the publication data. And uh, for many of these scientists who are working, um, especially those collaborating with scientists in China, um, told us that uh, these US China tensions had been scientifically costly for them, especially those with existing collaborations. They'd been administratively costly because they had to sort of figure out new reporting requirements and new um, regulations from the university. Um, some of them had stopped working with their collaborators in China and that loss of access to resources from China like machines, students, funds, ideas had been scientifically costly for them. They had been required because they decided to stop working with scientists in China, for example, to reorient research toward other topics. And they had to look for new sources of funding or new collaborators um, to continue uh, to conduct their research. So this is how they, they told us about how this is scientifically costly for them. Um, there was a clear reticence among these scientists to start new collaborations with scientists in China, even those that are unrelated to national security. People thought it was too risky. There was too much policy uncertainty about the future of US policy to really invest in these, um, in these scientific collaborations. So in summary, we think based on our, our data that the NIH investigations impacted the productivity of scientists, especially those with previous ties to China. We think these uh, impacts were larger in certain fields with high US-China collaboration, high NIH funding. This could have implications for US-China competitiveness, and we provided some suggestive data to, uh, to, uh, to uh, back that up. And currently what we're doing is we're trying to update this our paper with 2021 data. So now that we're in 2022, we can get all the 2021 data. You know, we only have these two years post treatment. And so now we have more information that we can um, use. And so um, that's one of the things we're working on. Um, and thanks to the Sloan Foundation for their support and also for the 21st, 21st Century China Center at UC San Diego. Well, thank you so much, Molly, and thank you, Rachel. And we're looking forward to hearing you, from you more later in the event. But before um, we do that, I and before I introduce the, our remaining three panelists, I wanted to take a moment to encourage our uh, listeners, our watchers, our viewers to visit our website if they haven't done so already. It's bigdatachina.csis.org. And there they can both read the feature where we summarize and um, present some of, you know, some uh, policy implications of, of the work that Molly just presented, uh, as well as um, I would encourage people to submit questions. So if you click on the event page, you can, um, you can actually, you'll see there's a button there where you can submit your questions live, and we'll be addressing those questions. I'll be asking those questions later in the event. So I really do encourage people to do this. This is a great opportunity to actually engage uh, directly with scholars and uh, policy experts. Now, without further ado, let me introduce our remaining uh, panelists. So we have today Deborah Seligson, who is an assistant professor of political science at Villanova University. She is also a senior associate non-resident here at CSIS as the trustee chair in Chinese business and economics. She's also a Wilson Institute China fellow and an associate at the Center for the Study of Contemporary China at the University of Pennsylvania. Her research focuses on Chinese politics, U.S.-China relations, and public health, energy, and environmental politics in China. She's also currently in Beijing, which um, is great for uh, collaborative research on uh, U.S. Uh, between the U.S. and China, and also great for us because she may be able to give us some insights from the on the from the ground in China. We also have Abigail Copland, who is also an assistant professor of sociology and science, technology, and society at Vassar College. Her research analyzes the development of China's biotechnology and agrotechnology industries to unpack how scientific innovation, business, and regime legitimacy co-evolve in the contemporary People's Republic of China, how the Chinese state contends with scientific experts and incorporates expertise in its governance schemes and how China's pursuit of high-tech development is a restructuring relationships among Chinese society, industry, and the party state. 
She is currently completing a book, book manuscript entitled Domesticating Biotechnological Innovation, Science Market in the State and Post-Socialist China, and a second project unpacking the social political mechanisms underpinning China's model of biological data capitalism. And finally, we have James Mulvinen, a scientific, uh, who is scientific research and analysis director at Periton Labs. He is a Chinese linguist by training and a leading international expert on Chinese cyber technology transfer, espionage, and military issues. In 2013, Dr. Mulvinen co-authored Chinese Industrial Espionage, which is the first full account of the complete range of China's efforts to illicitly acquire foreign technology. He contributed multiple chapters to China's quest for foreign technology beyond espionage, which was published in September 2020. And we're so lucky to have these three experts with us today. So what I'm going to do is first ask a few questions, and then we'll turn back to Molly and Ray Shui. And, um, and after, and then I'll have a few more questions, but after that, we'll be, we'll be turning to public, the public's questions. So I, as I said before, please do send us your questions and, uh, we'll, we're looking forward to them. So let us start with Deb. And the, the reason why I wanted to start with Deb is that she has recently offered a, a paper looking at the history of U.S. China collaboration in health, um, and science. So Deb, I would, you know, how, how do you view the arc of the relationship, and how does Molly and Rachel's uh, work fit into that? And also, how do you see, you know, how you know you're now that you're on the ground in China? How do you see things differently, or maybe you know, um, uh, what what does you know? How, what can you tell us about what you're seeing right now? Thank you so much. Um, so I'm really excited to talk about this paper because I think it is a, just a fantastic contribution and um, really fits into the arc, especially their finding that it's probably costing productivity in both the U.S. and China. Because if we go back to 1979 and President Jimmy Carter and um, Vice Premier sort of um, Deng Xiaoping signing the U.S.-China Science and Technology Umbrella Agreement, which is the first agreement signed under after normalization, the strong feeling in both countries was that science and technology cooperation would be to the benefit of both countries and would lead to greater wealth and advancement for both societies. And even though Chinese science at that point was substantially behind U.S. science, there was a feeling from the beginning that both countries were going to benefit. Even though it was mostly Chinese students coming to the U.S., not many fewer U.S. students going to China throughout the period, um, there was a lot of data to be learned. I mean, the, everything from uh, biology and diseases to dinosaurs to, you know, geological structures. China is an enormous place with a wealth of data. And if you're not here, you're missing a big chunk of the world. There were just so many minds to work with. Um, people first learned about the incredible wealth of sort of physics expertise if we go back to the 80s. And then I remember when, um, you know, one of the top climate modelers in the U.S. said to me, you know, climate model, you know, the best climate modelers in the world these days are in China. And, you know, by the time we get to the IPCC report that comes out in the early 2000s, um, fully 10% of the co-authors were from China on climate change. So just a sense of possibility. Um, the changes over the years that I would mark, a few, a few sort of signposts. Um, in 1989, in the Tiananmen um, Square demonstrations, uh, Chinese students in the U.S. were allowed to stay. And that fundamentally changed this original idea of Deng Xiaoping's that students were going to go to the U.S., come back and contribute directly to China that way. And instead created, I think, essentially seed migration that led to uh, sort of a 20 
20 is at least 20 year period where most um, Chinese who certainly studied for advanced degrees in the United States stayed there. But it's also what led to the richness of this collaboration because they still had many colleagues back in China. They had fellow students from before and they knew a lot of what was going on. Next big signpost I would cite is the 1998 Cox report. This was a congressional report that accused China essentially of stealing a lot of intellectual property. What's interesting about it is that the concern that triggered it was US companies voluntarily giving to China export control technology that they weren't supposed to give. It was two companies that gave rocket technology. The Cox report sort of accuses US government government labs and US academics of also giving away stuff with basically no actual support for those accusations. And it really started to sour the relationship in the late 90s. But then what happened was 9-11. China actually was very important to the US after 9-11. And the impact of the Cox report slowly receded over the next few years. And I would say, and actually that became the period of the richest growth in US-China collaboration. That's when I was science counselor at the US embassy. We brought in a health attache, a huge CDC group, NIH, a National Science Foundation office, and a Department of Energy office. Just incredible contributions on both sides, a lot of interest in working together, and really important advances, especially when it comes to global health, but many, many other areas. I'd say by the 1910s, the sort of the implications of the Cox report kind of reappear, especially this accusation of um, loss of intellectual property. Again, it's really important to note that academics generally don't produce intellectual property. They produce public peer reviewed information that shows up in journals. And so a concern that had a lot more to do with companies wound up sort of getting academics caught in the mix and really does doesn't have as much to do with science collaboration as it came to be implied. And, but there was, a because of so many changes in the relationship, by the late Obama administration, there was already a cooling off of people in the US government feeling the relationship wasn't going quite the way they wanted. A lot of concern about the trade implications, a lot of feelings that maybe it was more difficult. And that, I think, led to less pushback in the Trump administration for really cooling it off. The one question I would raise with Molly and Reisha is, I don't think that because something starts to decline in, 19, in 2018, that the cause is the thing that happened in 2018. I think it's a bunch of things in the sort of previous four years because publication is a lagging data point. And so what you have is the Trump administration left the US and China science and technology agreement unsigned for a year and a half. They canceled a whole bunch of agreements, including a really important NIH data sharing agreement. They, you know, and so I, and the Carolyn Wagner data seems to put the peak in about 2016. So I think it's also depends on what your data set is, where you see the decline. So I think the NIH investigations are important. And I find the the comments from the the qualitative interviews just, you know, I mean, it's really tragic. People's lives have been ruined. But I think the the story actually has a bunch of causal factors that um, I think would be interesting to investigate. But that's my quick summary. Oh, and in terms of here, people want to work with Americans. I haven't gotten such a good reception, you know, in years, because in the past we were a dime a dozen. People are really pleased to see anybody come back at this point. Um, and they feel like the U.S. government is um, very critical. They're, they're very unhappy about that. But certainly among academics, what they want to work with is their foreign colleagues. Great. Thank you so much, Deb. That's, uh, that was a very comprehensive overview uh, and very helpful.
Um, and uh, moving on to Abby, I, you know, Abby, you've looked at, at the biotechnology and agrotechnology industries uh, specifically, but you know, you spent a lot of time looking deeply into these sort of the, the research on the Chinese side, the connections. So how do you see, um, you know, the how from your point of view, how has this been playing out over the past, you know, in the recent recent years, and how does this fit into the research that uh, that Molly and Rachel did? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just for a little bit of background, I'm a little bit of an unusual researcher because I'm an ethnographer. Uh, I actually uh, live and work in Chinese agrobiotech companies and uh, biotech companies and do really extensive interviews. Um, I am ecstatic about the paper. Um, I think it is unbelievably compelling and is uh, capturing a lot of the similar dynamics that I'm observing actually in a more industrial setting, well, in, in a setting that kind of spans both academic and commercial settings. Um, purely for curiosity's sake, I would be really interested in hearing a little bit more about how you selected which scientists to interview um, and what their backgrounds are. Um, likewise, I would be really interested in hearing a bit more about not only how the collaborations are falling apart, but how they formed in the first place, if you got that data. My hunch is that um, you're going to find that it's not random, right? These relationships are built on really strong, uh, ongoing relationships of researchers on the ground. Um, and so I actually wanted to focus a lot of my commentary more on kind of the policy recommendations that come out of this paper. Um, one is that related to my previous point, um, we see a lot of discourse right now amongst policymakers that treat scientists as naive actors who are freely giving uh, their ideas at random. Um, my experience on the ground uh, spending a lot of time with these people is this is not the case, uh, particularly in the biological sciences where academic entrepreneurship is increasingly the norm. Um, researchers are super savvy if, I mean, at times <laughs> downright sociopathic about protecting their findings. They want credit for them. And so when they say that there's not a problem, um, I think that that needs to be a little bit more respected. Um, they are also the people who understand the intricacies of these technologies at the most inti intimate level. Um, and so they need to be uh, brought in more extensively into the national security conversation rather than having the dynamic be, oh, we need to teach scientists national security because they are these naive actors. Um, Relatedly, I would say that what does and does not constitute a national security threat, particularly when you get into the science, uh, the natural sciences, is not necessarily intrinsic to the technology. It is tied deeply to kind of the narratives that we tell about it. Um, we are currently in an era in which, you know, the boundaries of what is national security are kind of expanding in both the U.S. and China um, without a lot of check one, uh, about what is being lost in the process. Um, for example, you know, on the American side, all of a sudden it is quickly becoming the case that protecting the profits or monopolies of particular American companies like Illumina are suddenly being um, characterized as a national security issue. I would say a lot of American scientists who actually are trying to get cheaper sequencers who want, uh, you know, these technologies on the ground would probably disagree with that uh, to some extent. Um, Likewise, we need to be just kind of having more conversations, which is so what is so fabulous about this paper about what is lost, right? These ecosystems are actually deep, deeply complementary to each other, both on like a broader systemic level and on kind of a company to company level. In China, you can uh, easily scale things up. You can easily get access to a high number of patients if you want to do trials. Um, this actually benefits American companies who are trying to, um, you know, bring their drugs to market in a more efficient way. Similarly, even com company to company, you have these partnerships in which each firm really does have its own expertise. Like you have Arbor Biotechnologies that is an expert in developing, uh, you know, finding new enzymes to engage in gene editing. They partner with Eddie Jean, a Chinese company that's really an expert in ex vivo therapeutic uh, applications. And again, with the idea of we're bringing drugs that are going to cure disease to market as efficiently as possible. Um, the final point that I just kind of want to make that I think your paper does such a fabulous job of um, kind of starting to hint at, and I just would encourage you to kind of develop more, is this notion of competition. Um, biotechnology and the bio biological sciences in general are, you have to stay engaged to protect your competitive advantage. 
Um, there are fields in which the boundary of the cutting edge moves so quickly um, that if you don't stay engaged with your competitors, you're going to just, um, you know, fall back and fall behind. Um, it follows a little bit the in terms of the commercial side of things, I often say that it follows the pattern of how you compete in the basic sciences, which is you don't pick up your toys and go home and build walls around your lab. You make sure you're on the exact same panel with your competitor at the every academic conference. You go for a kind of passive aggressive coffee with them afterwards. You exchange grad students. You make sure that you are absolutely um, at, know exactly what they're doing, because even if they um, beat you to one punch, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to win the next time. There is not as extensive a first mover advantage in this field as there are in others. Um, anyhow, I have all kinds of thoughts about also uh, kind of genetic data, uh, data policy, et cetera. But I think I'll leave that to pri uh, to later rounds of questions. Thanks so much. Thank you. And hopefully we'll get, we'll get to more of some of more <laughs> of these details and, and the topics. Um, James, so I think, you know, we've, we've heard a lot about what is lost, um, you know, the, the challenges are brought on by these tensions, but you know, some of these, you know, policies were brought on by serious concerns. So what are the national security concerns and how how you know what's uh what's that um how does that perspective play into this and how do, should we consider and think about it as well so i'm i'm comfortable with the fact that i'm the token national security person uh, on this panel um those of you who know me know that i've also though tried to play a positive role in helping nsf and nih in sort of working through many of these academic integrity issues involving Sinus collaboration. I've worked with a lot of university leaderships to help them anticipate sort of critical changes in DC and how they could improve, frankly, some of the lacking administrative management of some of this collaboration uh, and working with DOJ um, to properly characterize and prioritize their investigations and prosecutions um, up to and including teaching Emily Post style etiquette classes uh, at FBI field offices about how to deal with academics. And lesson number one is always don't flash your service weapon in front of academics. Um, note to the data analysts in the room, though, um, all of the previous analyses that I've read in public, like the one in MIT Technology Review and other places um, about these cases are actually deeply flawed because they're missing some critical data sets that I don't think the authors knew they were missing. Um, in particular, there have been hundreds of debarments and suspensions of academics from federal grants um, that are not required by statute to be published um, and often are protected by internal university privacy rules. Uh, and I've been working with congressional committees to try and get um, those subpoenaed so that they could then be published in the federal register um so there's a lot of critical information that has been missing so you know in terms of assessments of how bad the problem is um so three short comments um you know you may not believe me but there are parts of the national security community that recognize that there are important areas of scientific inquiry between china and the united states that have absolutely no bearing on u.s national security and in fact have tremendous collective uh, scientific benefit um, climate science and biological sciences are al always in internal meetings cited as the top two issues um but you know number two the flip side of that is there are actually areas of scientific inquiry as as the authors have have conceded uh that do have important implications for u.s national security um and as the possibility of real military conflict over taiwan has increased in recent years uh, these are no longer theoretical concerns uh, for people uh, on the policy side. Um, and, you know, I will say that the securitization of science, you know, has not been driven by a bunch of racist John Birchers, um, but in fact, actual government assessments of the worsening threat environment uh, on both sides, and that increased possibility of military conflict. Um, and I don't 
to be honest, it's in the same way that the U.S. government people and the policymakers um, are not as savvy as they should be about the way science is created, um, my in interactions with scientists is that they also are not as savvy about the current military balance across the Taiwan Strait and what the implications of that are uh, for American lives. And so there's a dialogue of the deaf on, on both sides of this issue. Uh, but, you know, specific research concerns on things like quantum computing, uh, which has enormous implications for U.S. government cryptographic systems. Uh, hypersonics, which used to be a university academic um, activity that, you know, Virginia Tech and other places, and it is now a whole new class of troubling weapon systems that are pointed at the United States. Um, and the area I work on most, which is semiconductors, which, you know, are the foundational, it's the foundational technology that undergirds all the other advanced technologies in our home, including the thing we're using to talk to each other around the globe right now, um, you know, have really been um, identified as areas uh, that need new national security scrutiny. Um, and, you know, the previous administration obviously did a catastrophically terrible job of communicating across these lines. Um, this administration is trying to do a better job, um, but there's agency on both sides, right? Um, and so, you know, I have a sort of a practical advice um, symposia that I give at universities. Um, and the first thing I say is, you know, encourage your colleagues to actually fill out their federal paperwork properly um, if they wish to continue receiving federal grants. Uh, because that scrutiny is not going to go away. And, and you know, I, I don't have a lot of sympathy for it because my entire livelihood, my mortgage, my ability to put food on my table is actually directly related to filling out federal forms properly. Um, and so I, you know, I realized there was sloppiness and mistakes and things like that, but there was also sort of willful obfuscation. Um, and, and that has to be recognized. And that won't be, that just simply isn't going to be the way we're going to move forward. So we can have transparency, we can have collaboration, but there's going to be a higher standard on both sides administratively uh, moving forward. And that's just, that's just an unfortunate reality of the situation. Um, and there's going to be new changes coming down the pike that I'm happy to talk about in the Q&A, uh, including major changes in deemed export controls. Um, so the situation that you know, if Raytheon runs a lab in Shenyang um, where Chinese grad students in that lab use a uh, an instrument that would have that would require an export license if it was to be sold to a Chinese research institute, Raytheon ha currently has to get a deemed export license for that Chinese grad student to use that piece of equipment. But at the same type of lab at my alma mater at the University of Michigan, uh, they don't need to get a deemed export license. And there is going to be a move in the very near future to close that loophole, uh, which is going to have a big impact on U.S. universities where hard science departments have large numbers of foreign grad students. And so, um, again, that you know, 10 years ago, they tried to do that, and uh, university presidents went berserk about it, and it got rolled back. But in the current environment, that's just simply not going to be possible anymore. So there's those yeah. kinds of things coming down the pike that, you know, again, having that better dialogue about these issues um, will hopefully <laughs> remediate some of the some of the turbulence and friction that it caused. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. And I'm looking forward to hearing you talk more about these topics because uh, I do want to address a little bit where we're headed and uh, uh, you know what what also you know what policymakers should be doing and and universities and researchers as well. But before I do that, I do want to give a chance to Rachel and Molly to respond uh, if they have any comments or also questions for the, the panelists. Molly or Rachel? Yes. Okay, do you want to do you want to take this? Uh, sure. Yes. Thanks a lot for sharing. You know your thoughts and your experience. It's really I'm mainly like as you know, we're trying to learn more rather than defend our paper. <laughs> uh, so, but let me just uh, uh, you know answer some of the questions in each of the the comment discussant points. First, the depth. Thanks a lot for sharing the history. It's so fascinating, and and you know, especially for me, someone interested in economic history, I can think of many good topics to work on in the future. Uh, that said, you mentioned a, a very important, uh, actually, issue when we start the project. That that all you know, can we really look at before and after 
the AI AG investigation, given that research projects take time. So when we just started, we thought, oh, maybe this will be a five-year plan <laughs> style project. We didn't find something initially. Uh, gradually, you know, this takes place. But then, in some sense, to our surprise, the effect was already there. I think this is partly because these natural scientists write a lot of papers. Their turnaround time <laughs> is relatively uh, shorter. Uh, that said, we do find uh, I mean, that you know, it's consistent with the, the fact that projects take time. So the first would be this type of effect to become larger. Initially, it was small, but it's just over time. I think now we have the third year of data and it's more, more striking. And the second piece of evidence is this the, the pattern across fields is kind of a quite supportive of the influence of AI investigation. You know, another major challenge, even though you haven't mentioned, I'm sure the audience might also ask is about the impact of COVID, which could also affect the productivity of scientists. I think again, you know, the fact that this pattern, this effect is much larger for certain fields that should be more affected by NIH investigation support, you know, the relevance of this policy. Uh, that said, this is a very good comment. Uh, and Abhijit, thank, thank you for sharing your you know, thoughts, very thoughtful comments on the policy implication. I found this uh, the point about uh, uh, you know not science maybe in certain fields doesn't you know this first mover advantage mindset. This is almost like the semiconductor James mentioned. <laughs> maybe gives a you know policymaker too much in, you know thinking about being first mover. <laughs> so there's this intensified. Uh, computation, but maybe you know when we come to science, you know, for most of the fields, being the first mover may not be the same thing as you know being that in the semiconductor industry. Anyway, I found that fascinating. I haven't thought about that. And you asked about the interview. Uh, to be sure, it's not like a representative survey or something. It's more like a snowball thing. We start with a small group of our colleagues. And they recommend each other gradually. We, you know, reach a bit more. Uh, that said, Molly and I are trying to do a anonymous survey, you know, um, you know, which will give us a little bit more representative uh, sample to think about the related issues. Uh, and uh, and James, uh, and thanks a lot also for sharing your your thoughts on national security and uh, and the forms, et cetera. Uh, uh, and I was uh, particularly want to, more, more like a question uh, for us in our mind. We don't have a definite answer uh, related to what is, what, you know, which fields are related to national security. So for instance, well, in two striking pattern in our findings, oh, it's actually the field which gets more support from AIH are much more negatively affected. And the fields which used to have a lot of US-China collaboration are much more negatively affected. Now you can make two you know, arguments. You could say, oh, look, maybe the fields supported by AIH or where both China and the US work a lot are about national security. And if you make that argument, then we, you know, in some sense, you could argue our finding is related to national security, but it's not so obvious, right? Because many of the fields, uh, we can't direct, you know, when we see them, it's difficult to think they are not directly affected, uh, related, or directly related to national security. Uh, in a, we also had another look at the DAP, you know, which kind of research fields are more supported by DAPA or the you know related to defense, uh, there we you know we find that pattern is much less striking than the two uh, we focus on. Uh, so, but we'll be very very happy to you know talk with the people like you to think to go to think about this case by case. Is this reasonable? Because all these things could be related, right? Maybe China and the U.S. or you know both want to work on certain fields that are. Uh, have commercial and military uh, 
potential in the future. So that's exactly what we have been uh, curious about. And, and yeah, uh, thanks a lot. Again, you know, it's really, I learned a lot from all of you. And thanks for this great opportunity. Amali. Uh, yeah, just to, I mean, I think you, Reisha, you, you answered the, many of the questions in exactly the same way I would. Um, uh, you know, one of the things just reflecting on on James's comments, which are really great, is uh, is um, and and also uh, and also uh, Deb and Abby's um, is one of the things that we kind of came out from some of these interviews with is just how much of this um, uh, sort of chilling effect was coming from communication problems, right? Um, and and I know James, you've been working a lot on on making the communication better, right? Um, and uh, and just uh, first of all, between the university and scientists, um, you know, one of the things, at, as you said, there was just very unclear rules sometimes and unclear enforcement or clarity on the university's part to the scientists about what was required in the disclosures. So there are some sort of like people blatantly doing the wrong things with the disclosures. That was really not okay. And there's some people sort of unintentionally filling out in not really realizing and then they get caught up in this sort of um and 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 the result of that is that people feel like um and and also the result of sort of policy some policymakers saying you know we shouldn't be doing any academic collaboration with china that makes these science, some uh, many scientists especially we found those of chinese heritage who feel a little bit more under the microscope um uh to just sort of say no we're not going to do anything it's too risky um and um and so it's been I, I think there have been a lot of progress being made in that communication problem right in trying to figure okay this is national security this is okay this is not okay these are the differences right between um and and um BISPA between scientists and the national security establishments so hopefully as we move forward we can make more progress um in, on that front Thank you. Um, thank you, Molly. And actually, as we were writing the feature, I think we and our team, uh, you know, and the feature was co-offered by me and uh, my colleague, Maya May, we gave a lot of thought about, you know, what, you know, what policy recommendations to focus on. And I think, you know, I'm very interested in hearing um, more from James on, on his work on this, but essentially uh, continuing and reinforcing that conversation, those networks between governments, universities, and researchers, right? Because uh, I think Abby mentioned researchers, scientists are not um, naive actors, but they may also not be as, um, and, you know, they may not have as much of an understanding of what the broader strategic context is, right? And at the same time, government obviously needs a lot of input from the scientists themselves to actually understand the technology. So re reinforcing that, and actually universities are probably at the sort of the, the, the nexus point, right, where they can actually sort of help guide and um uh and also you know ensure that scientists are actually complying with rules and uh, you know not uh, engaging in tax fraud or whatever it is that they may be doing because there may be actually broader strategic implications that just go beyond whatever you know what is perceived as maybe a smaller infraction initially so that's certainly something we were grappling with and i'd like to hear more from from james on that and then also deb and abby and also note that we have received questions that that actually just you know did address this issue as well on how much um uh, you know how much the an nih funded collaborative research contributed to leakage of sensitive technology so if, if if you want to address that as well james that'd be great so so one thing that i i do want to highlight that the, there's a couple of points one is that the White House, and, and I don't think this got nearly as much attention as it deserved. And, and I just put the link in the chat. Um, and we all need to do a better job of publicizing it. But the White House memoranda on restoring trust in government through scientific integrity and evidence-based policymaking was a really important measure that tried to address the issue of the balance that they were trying to strike in science policymaking uh, between some of these national security concerns, but also then uh, emphasizing the importance of science. And a lot of the rules and recommendations that have come out of that and are now being implemented by NSF and NIH are, and DARPA and IARPA and everybody else um, are, are really, really critical. 
Um, one thing that I, I did want to highlight, though, and, and you know, you now have deputy and assistant secretaries in the executive branch departments um, constantly referring to Chinese military civil fusion. Um, and this is a dominant meme inside the administration. And so this gets to this issue about Beijing's agency and all of this, because when you publish a policy that intentionally blurs the distinction between civilian activity and military activity, and you imply as a matter of state policy um, that you want to break down those barriers so that you can take military advantage of things going on the civilian apparatus, that will energize elements of the U.S. policy apparatus to be more um, uh, circumspect and apply greater scrutiny to what we would describe as civilian science and innovation collaboration. Um, and that was being driven by the Chinese side. Um, and that's unfortunate. Um, and then I did have one Chinese policymaker recently say to me, he goes, well, we wrote it in Chinese. We didn't think you'd read it. And I, I thought that was quaint. Um, uh, Mulvenin's third law, of course, is that, you know, China regards its language as its first layer of crypto. Um, uh, but, you know, we weren't supposed to apparently supposed to read that, uh, but we did. Uh, and that has really energized uh, parts of the system. Um, one other comment that I'd make that, again, in terms of communication, um, the deputy director of NIH about a year and a half ago gave a very interesting public presentation that also didn't get enough notice. And one of the statistics, because you guys love your data, that came out of that was only 3% of scientists of Chinese heritage that they looked at um, actually resulted in investigations. Um, I think there's been a widespread and incorrect perception that all scientists of Chinese heritage um, were somehow uh, subjected to scrutiny under this, um, but only 3%, according to NIH and NSF. So that's also an important sort of caveat. Great, and we do mention the memorandum in, um, in the feature, and uh, we will also post it in the resource section so that people can read it if they want to. Um, Deb, did you want to take uh, take a stab at, at the at these questions? Yeah, three percent sounds like a lot to me. I mean, one percent of people unvaccinated with COVID die, and that was enough to have us all lock ourselves in our houses. And so I, I'm not that persuaded that that's a great number. And I don't think that there was an answer to whether anyone has ever found, you know, some deep, dark secret given to China via NIH funding. And this is where this slippage of that Ab, Abby was raising about what is national security and what isn't becomes a big deal. I mean, I spent so much of my time when I was the science counselor at the US Embassy in Beijing, just trying to get people in Washington who cleared visas to understand what each scientist actually did, because so much of it was nothing compared to what they imagined based on like a title or something like that. So I really think that there's a long standing problem with insufficient level of expertise on in specific fields in the people who are making a lot of the decisions about um, technology risk and uh, a mixing constantly of what is already commercial with what is actually at the cutting edge of basic science, which, as I say, in both China and the United States, the goal of basic scientists is to publish in public peer-reviewed journals. You know, China has become such a publisher parish culture. I mean, they have far exceeded the United States in terms of the competition that academics have to get published, to get promoted. And so I, I think, you know, yes, civil military fusion is an issue here. Of course, um, Eisenhower called it the military industrial complex. And so um, we've had it in the United States for um, 70 years. And I think we do have to recognize that, of course, this exists in both. Of course, dual use technology is 
going to increasingly be an important part of how things are done. But there's a difference between basic science and um, commercial application. And I think that often gets lost. And there's a need, especially when you're talking about basic scientists, to have people who actually understand a field in incredible depth, because this is not simple stuff. And um, the scientists are, in fact, the people who know it. The other people actually don't. But uh, Deb, the NIH and NSF investigations were conducted by scientists and and most of the abuse is uh, is is mistakes in grant grant statement right. which, I is, mean, which, about, which is which is which is why they were administrative penalties That's right the but, but the thing yeah. is it's really caused a dampening and people are genuinely afraid and if you read the um the fbi submission and the legal brief um against chung gong of mit i mean it it's incredible what people think they can say about ethnic chinese scientists and a lot of the um this and a lot of these have been settled simply because the the people accused couldn't afford lawyers and it was easier to settle than to go to court Chang'an was the first one whose university actually stood up and worked with him on it and paid for his lawyer. And I think one of the things that universities have to do is actually not say, okay, whatever this federal government says is exactly right, but that we have our own students and we have our own professors and we need to actually care for them and make sure that we know what they're doing and we protect them when what they're doing is right. Because until MIT did that, not a single university had. And that to me is a shocking failure, especially to care for your faculty and your grad students. Mm -hmm. Yes, I wanted to move on to Abby and hear what and hear your thoughts on this. I wanted, and yeah, also, I wanted to jump in about a couple of points here. Um, one, James, I absolutely take your point that they, the Chinese government published a policy on military civil fusion and that that will instill a reaction um, and that it does kind of, you know, focus government attention on uh, that as a deliberate policy. I will, however, also echo Deb's point a little bit when I put on my historian of science hat and say I am really hard pressed to find any technology throughout, like, to be blunt, like the entirety of human, human development that is not dual use in some way between the military and civilian sector. And I think that there is um, a little bit of a tendency to take buzzwords in Chinese policy and say that they are absolutely being implemented on the ground as written. Um, and as someone that, I, you know, is, is an ethnographer who is looking at how Chinese companies, how Chinese scientists, uh, you know, contend with the dissonance often between policy is written and how they want to achieve their goals on how local uh, local governments are trying to implement these often very vague policies, etc. There's a lot of complexity there that gets lost if you take, you know, policy as written and assume that that constitutes reality. Um, there, like China is not China is not China. Actually, it's an, you know, even within the government, people have uh, disparate policy or uh, disparate goals, shall we say, um, and they are working on the ground to kind of pursue those goals. Um, I would just also flag a couple of other kind of um, issues in the policy recommendations. Um, one being, I think it is, uh, or actually, sorry, let me backtrack and say the other thing is about the export controls that you were talking about, James. Um, I you know, would be interested in actually in hearing a, a little bit more about that. But I will also say that um, if we increasingly hinder the ability of international students and Chinese students especially to come and do grad school here, there are not necessarily Americans who are, you know, well-trained and able to take their spots. Um, and so, you know, preventing Chinese students from, from doing their PhDs, from working in these high-tech fields, really is going to hinder um, American research in, in, you know, pretty fundamental ways. Um, 
I do, however, also want to flag that there is, you know, it is not a one-sided story. The China, Chinese government has been actively taking um, actions that are also cooling research collaboration in various ways. Um, and one key one that I would flag that is not in the current policy recommendations are the recent regulations on the management of human genetic data. Um, talking to researchers on the ground, Chinese, re I, I will say they have a long history. They've actually been on the books since 1998 and they just were never actually implemented. Um, but as it's, you know, and in 2019, they basically like kept the same policies, but significantly increased the fines. Um, but this is an action that actually is saying that, you know, most is going to be, that you need approval from Mo for the Ministry of Science and Technology to engage in any international collaboration that involves the handling of Chinese genetic data. Uh, this actually has been a major hurdle for Chinese researchers to uh, engage in international collaborations, and they're pretty upset about it, to the extent, actually, that Rao Yi uh, recently published kind of a public-facing uh, op-ed criticizing this particular policy and the degree to which it has chilled um, collaboration. When it gets to the genetic data side of things, however, I will also flag uh, that the US regulations around uh, how we handle genetic data, whether it is a privacy issue or not, um, what kind of protections are involved, who can access it, who can sell it, et cetera, are uh, rather incoherent and kind of a hodgepodge of different policies that vary by state, uh, that vary by how your data enters the system, et cetera. And so we definitely need to get our own house in order if we are going to compete in fields like precision medicine. Um, these are fields that you just, you need data sets that are uh, millions and millions of samples. China, for institutional reasons about how healthcare is provided, is capable of generating those. Uh, we are not. I would also flag that the current policy of we're just going to cooperate with our allies is deeply problematic. Um, just because you're a democracy doesn't necessarily mean you have the same you know, views on genetic data. Um, for example, I will say most European countries uh, have basically directly opposing views on issues of privacy, particularly when it comes to the biological sciences and genetic data. Um, in some ways, the US and China actually have a more aligned view on this. Um, and so just, yeah, just throwing those, those ideas out there. Um, actually, can I add one more thing? The thousand talent plan also is uh, increasingly vilified, um, in American context. I'll just flag like the idea of kind of encouraging brain circulation or getting, um, you know, researchers especially uh, to re engage in return migrations in the natural sciences is by no means unique to China. Um, that is a policy increasingly adapted by countries around the world. India has similar uh, policies, even Ireland, Hungary, etc. Um, and so, you know, we I'll leave it there. We can discuss the Thousand Talent Plan more if people want to. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it needs to be contextualized within kind of broader global strategies of brain circulation. If, if I could add on the data point, this is an area where I think the Trump administration did a lot of damage because there were some data sharing agreements that were allowed to lapse. And one way to address the fact that China not has not only this particular data law, but a number of data laws, is to have government to government agreements that foster the sharing of data and also give scientists who come to China to work on that data some sort of legal, sort of treaty level protection, which is very helpful in China. I mean, if you're working with your partner and you run into trouble. And I mean, when I was science counselor, we had a group that was out in the middle of nowhere um, doing dinosaur digs that got picked up by the local government. It's extremely helpful if the Ministry of Science and Technology says, no, 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 that's under an agreement and you're fine. Um, and that's the same if it's, you know, the Ministry of Health or whatever. So I think more agreements is actually one way to address some of the data issues that I think are really um, a challenge for all of our work in China. Great. These are all very good points, and I'd love to keep the conversation going. I have a lot of, uh, you know, thoughts and responses as well. But 
uh, we are out of time. So I just want to uh, give the last word to Molly and Reishwe, uh and then I will, um, you know, I will just have a, co a couple of concluding words myself. Uh, Molly, Reishwe. Um, just want to say this has been a fabulous discussion. I've just learned a, a lot. You know, I think we uh, we really tried to approach this just from like, how can we estimate the impact from the data? And you guys have enriched it with both um, perspectives uh, 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 from from scientists and ethnography and also protects professors of national security and working in um, uh, science and technology relationships between US and China, uh, Deb. Um, and so um, I uh, I just really appreciate all your guys' comments. It's going to um, really help uh, our our work going forward. And um, and thanks uh, again to to Stanford and CSIS for having us. Well, um, Vesha, did you want to say something? Oh, just one advertisement. Actually, Molly and I we are produce a paper sewing on thousand talent fly in China just to. <laughs> unpack some of the misses so we are certainly keep you guys posted and uh, get comments from you uh, later <laughs> sorry for the marketing uh, <laughs> <laughs> no thank you so much for sharing that and uh, please do share it and maybe we can uh, have more collaborations on big data china so just a reminder to everyone that uh, we do have this event will be posted and we do have the feature on the website bigdatachina.csis.org and uh, keep stay tuned we have our conference coming up next week where we'll be discussing issues on US China relations uh zero covid and the China's economic outlook so uh, among other things and um you know stay tuned for more of our features we have public events we have written events and thank you again to Stanford for being a wonderful partner thank you to Molly and Reishwe thank you to our panelists today this has been a very interesting and thoughtful discussion and obviously on a very interesting topic, important topic that I think will continue to be uh, on, on the policymakers' mind as well as scientists and, and researchers. Um, thank you, everyone, and I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Thank you.